Hello, and welcome to Multi-State Collaboration, a guide to regional programming and planning. Today's presentation is going to be uh, presented by representatives from the Virginia Department of Health, the Maryland Department of Health, and DC HOSTA. We'll be providing you an overview with a description of the Washington DC EMA, the inspiration for our changes to how we went about collaborating together as three health departments from different jurisdictions that share populations, what we did for regional planning prior to 2016. 2016 was really the date that we began our intensive collaboration that we'll focus most on in this presentation. What's happening in our regional planning present day, the program shifts that were a result from our working more closely together, the impact of our regional planning, and the lessons learned and takeaways. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Peter DiMartino, and I am the Director of the Infectious Disease Prevention and Health Services Bureau at the Maryland Department of Health. I'm joined today by two co-presenters. Hi, I'm Clover Barnes. I am the Chief of the Care and Treatment Division at the DC Department of Health. And good afternoon. I'm Kimberly Scott, the Director of the Ron White Park B Program, which is in the HIV Care Services Unit at the Virginia Department of Health. And in a true spirit of collaboration, we'll be sharing this presentation. So I'm going to get us started with the overview of the Washington DC EMA. And then Kimberly will come in and then Clover will take us home. Um, so the Washington DC EMA is the eligible metropolitan area that's centered around the District of Columbia, but includes Northern and Northwest Virginia. 17 counties and some independent cities as well. And then five counties of Maryland, uh, which we refer to as suburban Maryland, suburban to DC. So by the title alone, you can tell how integrated we are. There are also two counties in West Virginia that are part of the DC EMA. And I think for many of us who live in that region, most of us, regardless of whether we live on the Virginia side or the Maryland side, would just say we live in DC. Next slide. We wanted to give you an overview of what our geographic distribution of our HIV uh, customers living in the DC EMA by county. And you can see, uh, even though the district itself is the smallest geographically, it definitely has the most utilization and the most densely populated area, uh, followed on the heels by two counties in Maryland, uh, Montgomery and Prince George's counties. Um, all three of those jurisdictions independently are also ending the HIV epidemic named jurisdictions. Um, and it gets more dispersed as we get further out but we do have heavy service utilization in parts of Virginia um, and of course some utilization in West Virginia as well. That's on the next slide uh, we give you a breakout of the overall cases living with HIV which really does mirror what we saw in service utilization density. So 46 percent of people living with HIV HIV in the EMA uh, call the district home. Uh, one in three, exactly one in three, uh, call one of the five counties of Maryland home. And then one in five are in Virginia. And then 1% of us live in West Virginia. So we have always worked as a region on some levels out of necessity. Um, but we really started working and we'll talk a lot about how we move towards a deep collaboration. But we acknowledge that when we came together and when necessity forced us to develop collaborative solutions, it was either about fiscal issues, data issues, or 
programming issues. And we wanted to make changes to address those specific instances where we had to work together by coming together and systemically maximizing coverage and benefit from Ryan White funds across the region, increasing duplication and allocations with Part A and Part B dollars, so really looking at how we could leverage and quilt together better coverage for everyone. We also acknowledge that many of our subrecipients were reporting the same data twice, had to administer two different fiscal systems, two different award systems, two different careware systems. Um, sometimes, and so we really did want to make it easier for our partners to be able to do the right thing. And so we wanted to make the pathway to that right thing much easier. And we knew that we could do that with some administrative consolidation. We also wanted to make sure that regardless of where you received services in the EMA, the services were uniform, that you were receiving the same type of care, regardless of what zip code your home address was. We wanted to make sure that our delivery system was taking into account that uh, many people don't realize when they cross a jurisdictional boundary because we're all. We also were very understanding that our network was somewhat limited. For example, in Maryland, the Part B program primarily funds the local health departments, the jurisdictional health office. And district, there's much more community-based availability. And so by sharing our strengths that way, we hope to expand our provider network. We also wanted to make sure that our customers, which is what we call uh, randomized program participants in the DCEMA, that our customers had the best possible access and the best choice of providers. So now I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly to take us through regional planning then. Thank you, Peter. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. When Peter says regional planning then, he gave you a marker of about 2016, and that's about the time period that we're focused on. And at the time, the planning was really siloed. Each state or jurisdiction did its planning independently. And while we had voting representatives from Ryan White Part B onto the DC Part A Planning Council, um, and they were voting members and participated in the process, there really wasn't a lot of proactive consultation uh, before the, the priority setting and resource allocation process or PSRA for Part A, there wasn't as much for Part B. And so it really was independent planning with some participation um, we certainly had greater collaboration, as I said, around the annual PSRA, and of course we had data sharing across the jurisdictions because each state needed to provide its HIV epi data uh, for that process. We had some interaction at national conferences. You see a couple of examples there. And when we were at these conferences, we might have a, you know, a quick hello, maybe a 10-minute conversation. We might uh, generate some innovative ideas about how we could enhance our collaboration, but when we got back home uh, to the respective challenges of operating our programs, a lot of those ideas never came to fruition. And as Peter said, that a lot of the interaction that we had was based on need, and I would say that it was very specific. It might have been about grant administration, it might have been about reporting, it might have been about uh, PSRA, but it was not um, really outside of those needs. Next slide, please. So we continue to focus on regional pre-planning or regional planning pre-2016. A lot of the interaction was around sharing HIV surveillance data, which started kind of around 2012 with formal data sharing agreements. It became the foundation for a lot of what we were able to do and how we were able to grow the collaboration in the DMV. As we said before, the contact was by necessity. Um, so we've already talked about little collaboration beyond what I described for the planning process, 
but we, you know, we would mostly, I think, kind of share complaints about service delivery or gaps, but there wasn't a lot of joint problem solving. It sometimes became, this is what's happening in your jurisdiction, can you please fix that? The interactions during the planning council structure were quite strained. Um, and there were a couple of things I think that, that contributed to that. The prevention and care were separately discussed and not always at the same meetings. There was a perception of lack of transparency in allocations and technical assistance. There were even interpersonal conflicts among members of the planning council and the leadership. And those things, along with other things, I think prompted uh, the District of Columbia and the mayor to dissolve that version of the Planning Council and restructured it to the DC Commission on Health and HIV, which we're going to be calling the DC COHA. And that um, new structure actually created a lot of really great things that, that uh, to come. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about the what we call the DMV meetings. And the DMV is our shorthand. You know, we always have to have acronyms and abbreviations, so this is our contribution. And it stands for Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. And we refer to ourselves as the DMV cross-jurisdictional uh, collaboration or the DMV collaboration. We started these meetings, and, and at the towards the end of this presentation, you'll actually see a timeline that lays out some of these things just to show you that it's really been, it was kind of slow in the beginning and then we progressively built on to things and we've got a really good track record of about four years worth of activities um, that and some outcomes that have really strengthened our collaboration. So we started these meetings in about 2016 or so. We meet quarterly and we rotate the responsibility to host these meetings. Um, and I'm calling it Big Tent here because it started out with higher um, level leadership talking about similar challenges that they had in their jurisdictions in terms of addressing the epidemic. But then as we started meeting, it became more big tent because more programmatic staff started attending. So there were HIV surveillance staff and Ryan White directors and service planners and housing coordinators and quality management teams and then our ADAPT and then we started adding on other programmatic areas like hepatitis prevention, comprehensive uh, harm reduction and drug user health, um, uh, lots of prevention activities and preps. So it really became, and then our, and some of our medical directors and clinicians were participating. So it became a bigger tent where we welcomed more people and we found that we benefited from a lot of those perspectives uh, to be able to um, move forward in how we were going to work together regionally. We've had approximately six to eight meetings to date. These meetings are day-long meetings. Uh, they were before COVID-19, so uh, day-long meetings. The agendas were set ahead of time by the program directors, so we have multi-level relationships. So all of those chiefs and directors of the, the different bureaus for infectious disease management and health departments would get together and they would contact their teams and they'd talk about, you know, what's happening um, in terms of meetings that, that what, what would need to be on the agenda. Uh, sometimes they were pressing issues and sometimes they were, uh, the in agenda was influenced by real time federal, state and local uh, political or funding changes. So um, the ending the epidemic money came, uh, Medicaid expansion happened in Virginia. And then we will talk a little bit later about changing the administrative agent for part A. So those are some examples of things that might precipitate the meeting, and then we'd add on some other things. Um, also, too, in terms of information sharing and micro-technical assistance, this is something that we found happened over time during these meetings. And, you know, it could be about service interventions, needs assessment processes, and grant administration, and it could be happening in real time. Next slide, please. Some of the outcomes of the DMV meetings, um, some of these are projects or initiatives. Some of them are processes and some of them are just ways to characterize our relationships. So we had enhanced data sharing, including the Black Box Project. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that project where 13 states are participating, well, it's actually more states, uh, participating on the Eastern Seaboard it's administered by Georgetown University, and really the focus of that project 
was to exchange HIV surveillance data for people to be able to improve um, their surveillance data. It helped us um, develop data to care initiatives, but it also set the stage for other types of data sharing agreements and memoranda of agreement or understanding that, that we would sort of wrangle out. And so while we started out with um, enhanced data sharing on HIV surveillance, we then moved to do more data sharing in terms of service utilization, fiscal data, uh, and other data beyond what we needed for reporting and planning requirements. And because we started sharing that data, we could intentionally deduplicate services and funding where we need it, but we could also talk about where we needed intentional duplication of funding uh, for services. We have robust planning body participation. As we mentioned, we have voting members uh, from uh, DC and Maryland on the COHA. We also have non-voting members. So participation is robust. People look forward to it. There's proactive uh, recruiting for any vacancies on the planning body. It helped us build relationships and it helped people know what was happening in each region for service delivery for political and healthcare landscape issues that affected our service delivery, what we were doing in terms of innovation or wanted to do together, and just being able now to ask each other for help. There's joint service planning and aligned allocations. I alluded to some of that. So, you know, we're gonna give some examples throughout then, but some of the particularly sharing what we were funding, uh, what the service model was, uh, where we thought we had gaps in services and unmet need, where we were going to spend certain pots of money. All of this was now really possible because of the relationship that we had through the DMV. Data uniformity was really important. Peter alluded to that in the beginning. So again, it goes beyond surveillance data. Um, we revised our data collection uh, templates to standardize what we're collecting. We changed the frequency for data reporting to quarterly. So we now have more consistent and similar data to look at across jurisdictions, but it allowed us to formalize um, and streamline the data requests within the jurisdictions in the EMA. And as a result, we end up having the, the data we actually need to discuss when we need to discuss it to make decisions about whether we're meeting our goals in terms of service delivery as well as expenditures. There are some other examples there of ad hoc collaboration and macro technical assistance issued, you know, around quality management, policies and procedures. You can see there one of the things we did is, you know, DC was certainly more advanced than Virginia in terms of rapid start or rapid initiation of antiretroviral therapy. They shared their protocols with us. We're now adapting it and uh, starting some pilot programs. So across the board, uh, whether it was tools, whether it was and whole area of improvement for the program uh, through quality management or collaboration and integration around STIs, hepatitis, and harm reduction. For me, camaraderie and trust, this really big red letters on the bottom of the slide, are truly important and I think some of the most important outcomes and the biggest outcomes we have with the DMV meeting. They actually undergird our relationship for present day collaboration and activities and they enable us to do more together and we proactively protect it and nurture it, that camaraderie and trust. And we look forward to seeing each other. And when we don't get a phone call back, we know it's not because somebody's ignoring us, but we know how busy people are because we know what's happening in a region. And that was so, so critical for us to be able to do a lot of the heavy lifting on some of the other activities we ended up doing. And as one of my Part A colleagues in DC said, it wasn't easy with rainbows, skittles, and unicorns, it, but it was strategic and it was beneficial. Next slide, please. So a little bit about present day. I talked about the multi-level relationships within the health department. Uh, they're at the highest levels of senior leadership, and then they become um, also paired with program leadership. Um, and program teams and sub teams. And so that allows us to deepen our engagement. And Peter Clover and I are part of one of those multi-level relationships and we're here doing the presentation today. We talked about the merger of the DC uh, DMV prevention and care planning bodies uh, that is now the DC COHA. And part of what was important about that is that prevention and care were integrated and it benefited the, the Part B programs as well. 
Program management is more streamlined and advisory body input is too. Um, we also saw similar restructuring across health departments with similar positions. And so um, I think that uh, Clover was one of the first to become the chief to provide combine oversight of prevention and care. We just duplicated that in Virginia with a deputy director. So structurally, we're also influencing how programs operate. Uh, we saw a change in the commissioner representation of geography, demography, the service agency people represented the service area. Uh, and it also brought in new leadership for our government and community co-chairs. And I'd like to give a big shout out and a whoop to Khalif Morse and Jennifer Zirkler, who are our current DC COHA co-chairs for the great job that they do. We talked about consistent data collection already and activities and templates across the health departments. And we find that when we're doing it related to the Ron White program, it allows us to also do it for other initiatives and other programs. The standing data requests allow us, like I said, to have the, the data that we need when we need it, whether it's at the DC COHA meeting or whether it's because we're trying to focus on some other initiatives. Peter talked about working to ensure that the quality and parity of services are similar across the region, which is critically important because our borders have our borders are transient for our customers. People live one place, they work someplace else. They may receive their care where they work. They may receive their care where they live. Um, this allows us to leverage funding and resources across the region. Um, and one specific example I'll give where, um, you know, uh, DC provides a, a lot of prep services for a lot of the clients in the, uh, or the customers in the EMA, um, which means for people who live in 11 cities, 11 counties and six cities in Virginia, that's prep services that they're getting uh, with the assistance of DC HOSTA versus um, what prep services are provided through the Virginia Department of Health, which has, you know, a lower budget. So it allows us to leverage funding and expand services. Next slide. So there are lots of ways that we're collaborating and hopefully when we're done, we'll be able to talk a little bit about some of these, some more examples in uh, greater depth. But we, we now do see true collaboration and partnership. The benefit is that it's not just for Ryan White funding, but for all parts of the health department. Uh, particular, regardless of what their funding source is and whether it's federal funds, whether it's local funds, whether it's state funds. We talked about leveraging funding mechanisms and resources. It's not just the money that gets leveraged, but it's also in Virginia, for example, procurement is a great partner for our program. But I know that some of my colleagues uh, and Clover and um, Peter might have more challenges with procurement in terms of the time or the type of mechanisms, but we've all traded um, on procurement, we've all helped each other out in terms of if it's getting money out the door, if it's partnering on an initiative, if it's partnering on a process. Um, so it allows us to be able to look at everything that we have and what works well in our program and bring it to the region, not just uh, putting all the money in a pot and saying, okay, we're going to provide services. I would say about this before we move to the last slide that I'm going to present on is that when the CARES Act funding came out. An example that this collaboration truly does work the way that we're describing it is that our initial response here in Virginia was, well, why don't we find out what Clover and Peter are doing in DC and Maryland? And is there something we can do together? We had different needs presented to our, our, our programs and our jurisdictions for COVID-19. But at least we automatically said, let's find out what what everybody is 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 what everybody needs and what challenges are and what we can do together and what we can do together we do this doesn't mean that all of our funding decisions will be the same in each jurisdiction what it does mean and the one of the greatest outcomes and benefits we have of this collaboration is that we now look at everything such as funding and how programs might shift the whole impact of the region and we do it proactively. We actually, as a region and health departments, consult each other before we do new initiatives or programs and talk about it with the rest of the group. So a way that I would describe this, and this is something that you can definitely feel, it's not just a, an expression, 
is that we're in partnership. We're not in competition. And I think everything that was pre or then, as we said on the slides, it really did feel more like less partnership, more competition, less communication. And so everything that we had pre um, that was a barrier, post we have the opposite of it and typically more. We still have challenges that we have to discuss, um, but we still kind of think that there probably is a greater chance that we get those rainbows and Skittles and unicorns now. Um, the next slide, please. This is a timeline slide, and it's really a little snippet of our collaboration of our journey. So it goes from 2016 to 2020 and beyond. So you'll see in 2016, we started those regional meetings and we were talking about things in little buckets, fiscal data and programs. And we kept talking, we kept sharing information, um, and then we ended up actually changing how we were doing activities together. Um, in 2018, the COHA became, um, the DC COHA uh, was unveiled and I gave a shout out for um, the leadership there, but one of the important things about that restructuring is that the DC COHA became the hub for us to communicate. It became a major touch point for us to be able to say, oh, we need to make sure that we bring that up at the DC COHA. Um, when you kind of look down into the fiscal pieces in 2019 and 2020, administrative agent change and regional um, early intervention services delivery model RFP, that administrative agent change um, for Part A was an extremely hard and complex process. It was not easy for anybody engaged, but we weathered through it. And as a result, I think we built more efficiency and greater opportunities for funding and, and, and opportunities for innovation, which is exactly what that RFP for status neutral services was. And just to tell you very quickly about that, that was us working together with representation from every jurisdiction in every stage of that RFP, from development and writing to deciding the data we were going to collect to holding the technical assistance webinars uh, for people to be able to apply, uh, developing the scoring criteria, performing the joint site visits that were part of the application process. And we, you know, we, um, um, and, and serving on the RFP panel. And so that really helped us do a project from the ground up. It wasn't just come and join us at the end and let us give you a little feedback and then we'll go away. And I, I think that, that, that um, the entire region really appreciated the approach and saw how collaborative it was. Um, just quickly, data, we talked about, there's the regional consumer satisfaction survey, the regional needs assessment, um, we've already talked about the black box. Um, hopefully in 2020 and beyond, Virginia is procuring a new client level data system, an example of how we can work together. We've got, had to do a lot of that research, including a lot of the security issues. We'll do the heavy lifting on that. And when we have it all ready, we can actually just package that up and give it to Clover and Peter with a bow on it and say, if you're interested in this system, here's everything that we did our research, we vetted it, you know, and then if they adopt it as well, that allows us to have even more seamless service, um, even more seamless data um, exchange and being able to pull data for reports. And the last in the programs, we talked about the early intervention service model. That was actually a, um, an enabler for Virginia to do um, its first. Peter talked about how there's who we contract with in the different regions. Most of our services in Virginia do not go through an RFP process, but because of the experience with the EIS and the importance of status neutral service delivery, we actually did a pilot uh, status neutral, an RFP for status neutral patient navigation services, which was a joint project between prevention and care in Virginia. And those awards are being made this year. So the impact and the ripple, we see it you know, whether it's we're doing large projects or whether it's how we actually try to, you know, do innovative projects or do service delivery or monitoring or evaluation uh, within the jurisdictions. And lastly, some regional special population and community engagement. We have different projects and programs that focus on prioritized populations. Um, and we're all trying to figure out how to reach and meet that unmet need. 
Um, so there may be services that we provide for people who are recently released from incarceration that we're exploring, adopting um, or expanding in D.C. and Maryland, and also looking at integrating trauma-informed principles into our entire service delivery system as a regional approach. And with that, I will happily turn this over to Clover. Thank you, Kimberly. So I'm going to pick up at program shifts. So one of the major program shifts we made that actually started us uh, in this endeavor of collaboration was changing our administrative uh, for our fiduciary agents. And uh, with the DCEMA being as large as it is expanding uh, four different jurisdictions, uh, our previous model prior to uh, this collaboration we used administrative agents um, in Maryland and Virginia who were um, responsible for basically being like many recipients. And we found that it just made us less cohesive um, in what we were doing and uh, a better partnership or a better uh, approach would be working to uh, be more collaborative with our health department, state health department partners. And it has worked out as Kimberly noted uh, very well in our favor. Um, and COHA, which is our uh, planning body, integrating our prevention and care bodies has worked uh, extremely well in that now we look at HIV across the prevention to viral suppression continuum and really looking at what it is uh, that we're doing regionally as we have representation from prevention from the jurisdictions involved as well as uh, the Ryan White Part B partners. And then as Kimberly discussed our regional early intervention services, it was a collaboration from start to finish. We couldn't have did it without um, the partnership that still continues today. Next slide. So our successes, we have learned to maximize the use and impact of funding. Uh, many of our partners that we work with, you know, are funded both by the Part A program in DC as well as the Part B programs and jurisdictions and um, working to understand and make sure that we are spreading those funds around like we did with our regional EIS project has worked really well for us uh, to maximize the access and the diversity of services that customers are able to uh, have in our jurisdiction or in our EMA. Um, we've worked to minimize the duplication of grant awards to providers, so there's not a real reason for all of us to fund uh, outpatient ambulatory health services at the same provider. So if I fund outpatient ambulatory health services, that means Kimberly or Peter could fund something else that will uh, expand the amount of services, the breadth and reach of services that are offered. We just talked about the increase in diversity of services that were offered. We now have a, a core services waiver where we fund more services that are in the support services uh, than we did in the core services previously. And that expands the diversity of services that are offered and available to the entire EMA. And then the creation of our regional steering committee to bounce ideas off of, as Kimberly discussed beautifully about how we uh, chose to speak to each other first before we started really strategizing around our CARES Act funding. And we continue to do that now. We will definitely ping an email to each other before we start to uh, create any plan or any formulation for things to come. Next slide. Challenges. So we've definitely had our challenges. You know, growth and change is not always easy. And we have uh, worked through those I would say masterfully, as we have uh, always kept our uh, shared mission of providing the best and safest services to the customers of our respective jurisdictions at the forefront of all the decisions that we've made. And so finding the balance between the innovation and all the wonderful things we could do, especially once we kind of purse out the money and we have money to do innovation and uh, the authority to from our respective leadership teams now making it fit within those legislative requirements. And HRSA gave us some very good feedback at our last uh, site visit to help us fit uh, our innovation into 
the right away requirements and guidelines that HRSA gives us. Definitely um, assuaging the concerns of our historical stakeholders and opposition. We met some very strong opposition to the change of our um, administrative agents and the dismantling of the previous uh, planning council was met with lots of uh, concern and lots of, uh, I'll just say, hoops to jump through, right? So that everybody stays on the same page and understands um, that these moves were made for the greater good of our jurisdiction and the people who uh, need and use these services. And I think we were only able to do that as well as we were by working together as a team. If we um, had tried to take it alone, you know, one jurisdiction by itself, I think we would have had a harder time in uh, moving forward. And then measuring change management definitely can be elusive and complicated. So no change comes without some type of strife or stress. And we definitely um, have had to figure that out. But I think one of the great things we found in that challenge is that we are all change agents and we have found um, partnership and created better partnerships as a result of the stress of the change management. Next slide. So our takeaways or what did we learn from all of this or what do we want you to take away is uh, commitment. So commitment to find areas of interest and opportunities within all of our departments uh, kept everything going forward. It kept us moving through the difficulties, kept us moving through the challenges and the um, sometimes hostility that we faced in some of these changes. Um, leveraging our funding mechanisms has been uh, a fundamental change that we've made, but it's also made our EMA much more um, diverse and we are starting to see some better outcomes from our customers in, uh, as they move forward and, and are able to access a different variety of services and also the parity of being able to access those services regardless of the jurisdiction that you live in as long as you're within the EMA. Um, the cross-pollination of information shared with subrecipients has made our partners, our subrecipients, become better partners with each other. So they also understand and know better what is happening around the region and can look to each other to share information as well as to uh, share best practices of ways to implement services across the region. Our quarterly in-person meetings are phenomenal. We actually plan uh, some fun outings around them and, and they have become uh, something I look forward to personally every quarter. Um, I honestly had never been to Richmond before those meetings and so it was, uh, it was a great way to get out and to really understand what happens in each of the jurisdictions and know what they look like. Um, having them in person and having them planned with all of our um, leadership as well as our other uh, colleagues in the health department has been an integral part to how we've been able to be successful. Uh, monthly calls amongst our surveillance team for each health department have helped with cluster investigations and um, follow up from DIS and making sure that we are all following up all our cases and that we have clear data for our EPI teams. They continue now and they have been uh, a great tool for the surveillance teams. And then embedding partners, uh, we have an epidemiologist and a DIS that come from Maryland that are embedded in our health department um, and making sure that we are exchanging data and cleaning data and sharing data as accurately and as uh, expeditiously as we can has been a great uh, way to move forward. And we only got there from the meetings, from the understanding, from the talking, from the explaining how each of us do the work that we do and having shared goals. Next slide. Questions. 